This happened when I was trying to make the 19-hour drive from Connecticut to Florida without stopping to sleep. I was on I-95 South just after midnight somewhere in South Carolina, and I was about 100 miles away from running out of gas. I saw a sign that said there was a gas station at the next exit, so I got off. The exit ramp turned into a four-way intersection. You could turn left or right, or if you went straight, you could get right back on the highway. I pulled up to the end of the ramp, looked to the right, and there was the gas station. I started heading in that direction, but then I saw something that made me slam on my brakes. I looked at this gas station, and I suddenly saw six people, dressed in white shirts and white pants, dancing around the parking lot. It creeped me out. I didn't think there was anything supernatural about it at the time, but it was really odd that a group of people were dancing in an empty gas station parking lot around midnight. I didn't hear any music, but all six of them were moving like they were in a big mosh pit. Then one of them noticed me. He had been dancing very fluidly right at the front of the gas station, but all of a sudden he stopped, looked right at me for a few seconds, and started walking toward my car really quickly. As he took the first few steps toward us, he seemed to just... snap. I don't really know how else to explain it, but it looked like the man's spine completely bent at a 90 degree angle as he lurched into a weird power walk and continued walking right at my car, staying all hunched over like that. I floored it, went straight through the intersection, and got right back on the highway. As I pulled away, my girlfriend and I simultaneously said something like, Did you fucking see that? Her version of the story was identical to mine. The only difference is that she only saw five gas station dancers, whereas I saw six of them. We got gas at the next well-lit rest stop, an actual truck stop, not just some gas station off the side of the road. She's my wife now and we have an unofficial wedding vow that will never stop in South Carolina for gas at night again. I was driving at about 1 to 2 a.m. coming home from a board game night at a friend's place that had run really late. They lived in a rural area, so it was a long and lonely drive home. I was alone in my car. There were three odd things that happened in quick succession. The first is that I drove into a very heavy bank of fog. The fog wasn't even that uncommon in the area, but only in the mornings and never after midnight. This area wasn't close to the ocean or something, and there was no wind so it couldn't have been blown from somewhere else. Weird, but not unexplainable or scary. I reduced my speed so the car was only doing 40 or so and continued on. Eventually, I drove out of it. The second was that I came upon a huge tree that was on fire completely engulfed, had to be at least three stories tall. It was a fair way from the road, and there was nobody I could see around it. Sometimes people burn out old trees, but why would they do it at 2 a.m.? There had been no storm, so it couldn't have been a lightning strike. The weirdest thing about it was that it felt strange looking at it, like it was some kind of portent or omen. I'm not a religious or superstitious person, but looking at this tree, I can't even explain the feeling like something important was happening or coming. But on I drove. Then I came upon a section of the road that was undergoing maintenance. It's not unusual to see crews working on roads all hours of the night, but in this case there was no crew. I slowed down and stopped, because there was a sign up saying to wait for directions. There were half a dozen trucks with lights flashing, windows down, one of those small bobcat things with a scoop on the front like a miniature bulldozer even a radio playing somewhere, even though I couldn't see it. The scene is burned into my brain five years later. The song American Pie was playing on the radio, and suddenly I was afraid. More afraid than I had ever been before or since. I have been bitten by a deadly snake miles from help, had a gun pointed at me by a schizophrenic, seen my sister nearly fall off a cliff. But never in my life have I been as afraid as I was in that moment. It was like I was actually having trouble catching my breath. It was flat ground in every direction. Even if these dozens of men had decided to hide as some sort of prank, there was nowhere for them to go. Then suddenly the song kind of skipped on the lyrics, mm, the jester stole his thorny crown. Except it wasn't like the same section of the song was just playing again. It was more like time was skipping. I don't even know how to explain this. I suddenly realized that something terrible was about to happen to me. Probably the same thing that had happened to the road crew. So I punched the gas, foot straight to the floor. 
For two long seconds, nothing happened. The car didn't even move despite being in drive with the engine running. Then suddenly the acceleration started and I was pushed back in my seat, almost sideswiping some of the trucks. I drove at an unsafe speed for about another 15 minutes, and the feeling of danger was gone. Then I pulled over and cried my eyes out. I was actually obsessed about it for years afterwards. The weather reports didn't record any fog, and I posted to Facebook groups in the area asking if anyone else had seen it, but nobody said they had. I drove the route a week later in daylight looking for the charred remains of the tree, but could never find anything. Even if it had burnt to the ground, there still should have been a patch of dead grass. I call it up the Department of Main Roads and esked them how long the work on that particular stretch of road would be continuing, only to have them tell me that the last maintenance they had done on that area has been seven years ago, and not in the section I described. When I went back to look for the tree, I could see no evidence of any fresh repairs. In fact, there were several potholes, and that is usually the first thing fixed. I actually ended up going to see a psych about it. I was worried I had experienced some kind of adult-onset mental illness. He couldn't seem to find anything wrong with me, so I never got any answers. It wasn't a spooky kind of creepy, but one time when I was 20, I was on a drive home and it was about an eight-hour trip. There ended up being a traffic accident on the way, so I got held up, but couldn't afford to book a hotel for the night. About four hours from home, like 11 p.m., I was on a stretch of secluded highway, and there was a car behind me, but I didn't think anything of it. The same car followed me for the next hour, but I assumed that they were just going to the same place. I ended up stopping at a gas station to grab an energy drink, and the car stopped across the road but didn't get out. Again, I didn't think anything of it. When I left, the car pulled out and followed me again. I kept driving, and about an hour later pulled over at a rest stop to use the bathroom. The car, still behind me, stopped at the entrance of the rest stop, but didn't get out. At this point, I got super creeped out. I was like two hours from the next city, home, so I didn't know what to do. Just to be sure I wasn't going crazy, I pulled over at the next pullout. The car pulled over on a pullout behind it, but on the other side of the road. Again, they didn't get out, but just sat there. So I kept driving, and as soon as I got back into my town, I called my parents to tell them what was going on. They told me to go downtown and make four left turns. I did. And again, the car followed me. My parents told me to drive to the police station. The car followed me the entire way to the police station, and as soon as I turned in, they peeled off like 50 kilometers over the speed limit. I went in and told the cops what happened, and they sent a patrol officer to find the guy, but I never heard anything about it. I have no clue what the person's motives were, but it terrified me. Now I'm super cautious any time a car is behind me at night and takes the same turn I do. Was dating this woman who was afraid to drive, or for some reason refused to, at least on the highway. I never knew why. I worked the late shift at the time. One day I got home at some crazy hour somewhere between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. I had taken the following day off because her favorite band was playing in a city two hours drive away. She woke me up at 7-ish a.m. to wait in line. She had to be first, front and center. Guess who drove? I told her I was planning on getting some rest in the car while she held out spot in line. We got there, no line. Employees weren't even there yet. She's mad at me for trying to get rest in the car. I go sit with her on the curb. Hours go by, no one else in line. First employee walks by and offers us hot chocolate because it's February in the Midwest. People start lining up behind us in the late afternoon. I'm pissed. I could have slept before this ordeal. We attend the show. It was fun. Drive home and I ask her to drive. She refused. I drive us home. It was the scariest drive I've ever had. I was so tired and physically exhausted that I was hallucinating. I didn't know I was at first. The clouds on the horizon was the traffic in my eyes. It clicked with me when I was focused on one particular cloud and thought, that's a big truck, why can't I pass it? After I realized my condition, I again tried to suggest she take over. Refused. I tried to take control over my mental state and focus. 
got us home okay. Drove very cautiously and kept reminding myself of what I was seeing and what my brain was trying to make me think I was seeing. Got home, passed out immediately, but had to work the following day and for the rest of the week. So I wasn't able to catch up on that lack of sleep for a while and that week was so draining. I resent her for putting me in that situation and it scares me to death, afraid of having to go through that again. This was about 12 years ago and we broke up a while after that experience. Went on a cross-country RV trip this past spring with my friend Melissa and her seven kids and two young German shepherds, starting in West Virginia, in a 20-year-old RV christened Big Betsy, and almost everything that could go wrong did go wrong, ha ha. Among other things, the water lines broke the night before, so we had to rely on jugs of water the whole trip. The gas tank cap was busted, so it was a bitch to get the cap off. Tires had good tread, but a couple were pretty old, so they worried me. We found out the aux battery sucked, so we needed to jump start them with a power supply every time we stopped. The main battery cable had a bad connection, so every time we started the engine, I had to stand in front and jiggle the cable while she turned the key. The slide jammed, and we had to get a pry bar to get it in and out. Driving through Colorado Springs, we blew a spark plug out and had to stop for repairs. Luckily, her brother, who used to be a diesel mechanic, was traveling with us. Only took a day to fix. Regardless, we were still having a great time seeing the scenery, stopping at landmarks and national parks like Garden of the Gods, Mesa Verde, and the Grand Canyon. The furnace went out the night before we got to the Grand Canyon, and it got down to 17 degrees. I got up every hour for 10 minutes to heat the RV a bit using the propane stove, turned it off to rest, and then did it again every hour that night. Went to Roswell, Las Vegas, then on to Malibu to see the ocean in LA for a couple days. Then we headed up to Yellowstone and were blown away not only by the park itself, but the drive there from California through Utah and Idaho, just so breathtakingly beautiful. If you've read this far, you've come to the point of the story. After Yellowstone, we had to leave from the west entrance, since the other roads, east and south, hadn't been opened yet. We drove up into Montana, and for some reason, her brother insisted on getting off I-90 onto a two-lane highway through the Crow and Northern Cheyenne reservations. He was perpetually driving like an hour ahead of us because his RV was faster, and he's a bit of a reckless dude, but we didn't want to be far from him in case we ran into engine trouble again, so we didn't really have a choice but to follow him. Even though I voiced much hesitation on taking a back road route in the dead of night through a reservation. So we find ourselves taking the ramp to Route 212, had just gotten onto the Crow Reservation and stopped to gas up, and immediately things just feel odd. It's past 10 p.m., and as I'm pumping gas, I'm hearing children running around playing off in the dark, and cars keep driving up slowly to check us out. I get back in, and Melissa is already saying, Get us out of here. It's creepy as fuck. So I do. We haul off down 212 in pursuit of her idiotic brother. All right, he did save our bacon in Colorado Springs, so maybe idiotic is too strong. There is just nothing out there. Inky black skies, long desolate roads, sporadic groups of four or five houses every few miles. I'm acutely aware that we lost cell service as soon as we got on that highway, so I'm just praying that nothing goes wrong. I try to ignore the acute feeling that something is watching us. Her dogs start whining in their cages. The feeling of unease has continued and I really don't want to stop, but Melissa said we needed to let them out to poop or we'd be cleaning up a mess. I pull over next to a big field and she gets her oldest daughters Ariana and Isabella to leash them, and I throw open the door and let them out. As soon as they hit the grass, the two German shepherds sight on something out in the darkness and start going absolutely apeshit. They're barking and straining against the leash and the girls are struggling to control them. My blood pressure spikes. I look over at Melissa, and she looks completely bewildered, and I reach up to the overhead compartment and pocket my handgun I brought for protection. We get the girls and the dogs back in the RV and peel off down the highway again, cognizant of the fact that we're probably going to have to clean up shit since they wouldn't potty outside. They're back in their cages and are continuing to whine. I drive on for another 30 minutes or so, and they're still whining, and Melissa says we really need to stop again to let them go outside. This is the last thing I want to do. 
Because the whole time, I still feel like something is watching us, and I'm just running through my head all the scary stories I've read about evil spirits, wendigos, and motherfucking skinwalkers and shit. And I reason with myself that I'm just scaring myself and they probably smelled a fox or coyote or something. And I really don't want to clean up dog shit from the cages on the side of a forgotten highway using jugs of water in the dark. We pull over again, and this time I take my gun with me and walk outside with the girls as they take the dogs out. I distinctly remember thinking, I don't know what good a gun will do against evil spirits, but I'm not going down without a fight. The moment their paws hit the ground, they immediately start howling and barking into the darkness again. The hair on the back of my neck stands up, and I look at Ariana, and she has this look of terror on her face. I say to the girls, get the dogs back in the RV, we're getting the hell out of here. But her dog Hazel is straining so hard at the leash she can't get her inside, so I pick up this German shepherd in both arms and fucking heave her through the door and run inside. As I lean out to pull the door closed, I think to myself, this is the moment where something with sharp claws grabs my arm and pulls me into the night. Thankfully, as I'm here writing this today from my bedroom and not the belly of a wendigo, this does not happen. The dogs go back to their cage and continue whining. I jump back in the driver's seat and gun it down the road, and Melissa leans over and says in a panicked whisper, What is going on out here? Don't you feel it? Am I crazy or something, or does something feel really wrong? I glance at her and remember one of the big no-nos of skinwalker lore. You don't talk about them. You don't even think of them if you can help it, because it draws their attention to you. I say, no, you're not crazy, but I can't talk about it right now. I feel it too. But just trust me, we can't talk about it right now. As I'm cresting a small hill on the highway, I look over at her and say, Just trust me here. We'll talk about it later, okay, but we can't right now. I look back ahead, and there is an enormous white rabbit standing on its back legs in the middle of the road. Looking back now with the benefit of a cool head, I'm sure it was just a bit bigger than normal, but I'm telling you in that moment, it looked huge, like it was 3.5 feet tall. I swerve this 37-foot-long RV around this beast of a hare, but thankfully keep control. I put the pedal to the metal and say, I'm sorry. I don't care if the dogs shit in their cages. I'm not stopping again. And I didn't. And thankfully, they didn't loll. We made it to the town of Spearfish safely and stopped for the night. And after visiting Mount Rushmore the next day, we recounted the fear we all felt that night. And I told Melissa specifically why I didn't want to talk about it in the moment. And she said, yeah, I knew why. I've read all kinds of stuff about Native American legends. And I realized later with a chuckle that maybe those spirits were real. Maybe they weren't. But if they were, they probably didn't appreciate my wearing a Cleveland Indians cap through their reservations. Not early morning, barn late night, but fuck it. Driving my little sister to her softball practice around afternoon-ish when I was about 16 or 17... I hadn't had my license for very long, and my parents' policy was that if I ever saw someone in need of help, I should never stop. Call the police and keep driving. We lived in the middle of nowhere, miles from the nearest town, in an area with few houses or traffic, just cornfields. We were about halfway to the softball fields, and it was the time of year that the corn stalks were high. I remember that because there were cornfields on either side of the road, and this man in a black hoodie came running out of the field on the left-hand side. He sees my car and sprints out into the road, waving his hands to force me to stop. I can't see his face beneath the hood, and I'm going about 60 mop at this point. I veer off along the shoulder to avoid hitting him, then step on the gas, and I don't fucking stop. I'm not really sure what his intentions were or if he needed help. There were no cars broken down nearby, and he had come out of the cornfield. I had heard enough horror stories about people doing such things to ambush cars out on those isolated roads, with friends lying in wait where the driver cannot see them. I didn't stick around to find out, and I never heard anything else about it. This happened around 20 years ago, in Johannesburg, South Africa, where I grew up. 
I was driving back very late from a night out at a club. I'd had a couple of beers, very stupid I know, and wanting to avoid the main roads, I took a detour down a very quiet and winding back road that bypassed the main road and popped out near my house. Would take a bit longer, but much less chance of the cops stopping me. This was about 4 a.m., absolutely nobody on that road at the time. Going pretty slowly, I rounded a sharp left bend in the road, and as I did, I saw a woman, clearly of black African descent, but with the most remarkable albino coloring, alabaster white skin and hair. She was standing on the verge of the road, staring directly in the direction where I was coming from. She was dressed in nothing but a flimsy white skirt. No top, no brassiere. Bare breasts, barefoot. She was grinning. Not just a smile. A manic, horrifying grin showing all her teeth, and as I slowly passed her, we locked eyes. As we did, I noticed she was holding a small knife, like a builder's Stanley box cutter, and her hands and wrists were covered in blood. I absolutely crapped myself, nearly lost control of the car, and as soon as I had passed her, I sped up. I could still see her in the rearview mirror, looking at me and starting to walk into the middle of the road following in the direction I was driving. I spent a few seconds driving away as fast as I could, watching her in the mirror the whole time and all I could think was, oh my god, what the absolute fuck is that? Then I rounded the next bend and lost sight of her. I got home, about ten minutes later, absolutely shaking with fear and in a near panic. After a couple minutes at home I calmed down a bit and then started worrying that something terrible had happened to her and that she needed help. There was no way I was going back out, so I called the local police station and told them there was a near-naked woman on the road that was hurt, potentially armed, and needed help. They asked my name and I hung up on them. I used to dream about her for months after that. I still wonder to this day who she was and what had happened to her. I can rationalize it now, and most likely she was someone with a mental illness or suffering a psychotic episode and had self-harmed. A part of me wishes I'd stop to try help her myself, but the honest answer is, the experience terrified me to my core, and my only thought at the time was to flee.